Um, so a couple of housekeeping things. Uh, our Q&A, uh, the questions, we're going to take them via the chat. Please feel free at any time to enter them into the chat. Uh, if you think of something while things are going on, we're going to monitor that. Uh, without further delay, I'd like to hand this over um, to Jamie Nogas, who is going to be introducing our panelists to us. Thanks, Jamie. Thank you, Sarah. So our first speaker is Dr. Dustin Bunch. Dustin is an assistant director of clinical chemistry and laboratory informatics at Nationwide Children's Hospital. He's also an assistant professor of pathology at The Ohio State University. And today, Dustin's going to share with us what data analytics means at his institution and how they access their data and discuss some of the way that they've used data analytics. Handing it off to you, Dustin. Thank you. Uh, first, I wanted to say thank you to everyone uh, for hosting this and for Cycle for inviting me. Um, but without further ado, uh, I, I will give you a little bit of background of what we do here at Nationwide Children's Hospital. So I, as the Assistant Director of Laboratory Informatics, I sit in a unique position at our institution and in that we have an actual hospital informatics and a laboratory informatics group. And they are two separate groups. Um, we interact a lot but they are not, um, um, their command structure does not go through the same uh, side. So for that, uh, we are, our laboratory informatics has historically been about uh, the same things most laboratory informatics groups have been about, data transfer, data storage, and data access. More recently, we added data analytics to that uh, stack of information that they are doing, and we actually developed uh, our own um, data analytics group. So we have two data analytics scientists that work with us. And uh, their primary focus has been on creating um, two different things. Uh, pur their purpose has been to uh, mainly, has been historically been focused on uh, the business side of things. But since I've come on, we've uh, pushed them, and uh, they are now doing about 50% business side of things and then 50% laboratory side of things. And so on the laboratory side of things, you can see that be split into two things, operations and clinical. And one of the things that we've been helping uh, with is getting data access to them. So I, I, I mentioned that the laboratory informatics deals with data access. And historically, that was only focused on security in and out of the LIS and um, different platforms that you're using throughout the system. But it's not necessarily the data you need to do the data analytics. And so what we've started to do is find different ways of granting access to things. And so some of those things have been dashboards. Uh, and a part of that process is getting the data into the hands of the directors so that they are able to do something with that data. And so for the longest time, uh, they would always ask either the L before the data analytics group, the LIS group, to get reports. And so often everything was reports, right? So what's wrong with reports? Reports are static. Um, and reports have to be built by someone. And so that someone may not necessarily know exactly what, they, what the people need. And so we have been trying to create um, different avenues for people to get that data. And one of those avenues has been uh, dashboards. We have, um, uh, we have a couple of different um, products that we use. Uh, we use ClickSense um, to create dashboards for us. Um, and most of our uh, clinical pathology group uses that. Uh, we have um, an R Shiny app that is um, situated more for our AP people, and we've developed that so that they can search through their records and um, look through their uh, natural language um, search functions for things. And that's been really helpful for them for their research and for you know doing their studies and um, doing their uh, uh, teaching portions of things. So that's been really great. The other thing that uh, we have found is that these aren't the these aren't the final solution, right? These are a, a solution that uh, gets us about I was going to say halfway, but not even halfway there. Uh, so one of the issues that we encounter with these data access is that a the data is not in real time. We do have a few real time uh, applications um, that we use uh, on the lab operation sides. We have some stat monitors um, and and. Uh, turnaround time that can be done in real time. But other than that, there's very little real time data. Um, all the data in those systems is set on a, um, 
gets updated every 24 hours. So about 3 o'clock in the morning, there's an update to the system, and everything from that day gets put in there. So that's not a perfect solution. Uh, the other thing that we have found is very difficult is uh, interacting with uh, micro data. So microdata has an extra label, layer of difficulty in that this, the LIS system we have did not house that in an easy way to access the data. So a lot of the things we do with ClickSense we can't do for microdata. And so we've been actually working really hard with uh, the micro department to be able to get a lot of their data out of the system. Um, and it's never uh, straightforward, and the, we've had a lot of changes in our systems. So we've had new instruments come in, we've had new things go in, and all those require new interfaces. And every time you do that, they tend to break things, and then you have to redo things. Um, so as part of that, uh, we've started developing apps, and uh, along with those apps, we're deploying them with uh, Docker. And so Docker encapsulates those and allows changes to happen, but not affect the thing that you're working with, which is, I think, the biggest advantage to us for using those. Um, so those are some of the things that we're doing. Um, data access is, is all about having actionable data. It, it does no good to get data to people, but they can't do anything with it. And we, we found that is a difficulty no matter where we go. And like I was talking about reports, they're, they're outdated, but they also, the people getting the data, a lot of times they were doing filtering and on the data after they got it. And it's like, well, really, you only needed this one column of information in the first place. Why couldn't we just give you that one column of information? And so we've been trying to find ways of automating some of that and uh, getting the data specifically that the people need. So this has been a, a, a constant... Uh, well, it's kind of a revolving door, right? Every year we do a, uh, we meet with different departments and say, hey, these are all the reports you have. Are you still using them, first of all? If you're not, we're going to get rid of them. Second of all, is there any way we can improve these? Can we combine some of these reports? Is there any way to give you real data in real time that you need other than these reports? And so that's been a constant uh, project for us. Uh, we'll, we also have some historical things that we're trying to um, get rid of. So we're, we have a crystal report database and, um, that we use, but that is slowly, um, that it's really outdated. And so instead of continuing with crystal reports, even though it's an, uh, a standard for the hospital, we've leaned more on R for doing those reports. Um, they're a little bit more amenable to our changes, and we can control how... Um, new and updated the uh, reports are. So that just gives you a little overview and a kind of a top-down uh, view of what data analytics is here at, uh, nationwide. And so I'll, I'll let Jamie take it on. Thanks, Dustin. Uh, so our next panelist is Dr. Lucia Sepiashvili. She's a clinical chemist in pediatric laboratory medicine at the Hospital for Sick Children. She's also an assistant professor of laboratory medicine and pathobiology at the University of Toronto. And today, Lucia is going to be telling us a bit about her perspective on why we need data analytics in lab medicine, list some practical ways of how we can use data analytics um, in our day-to-day -day work. So I'll hand it over to you. Thank you very much, Jamie, for the introduction, and thank you, Cycle, for and AACC for having me here. Um, so, can you see my screen? Yes, we can. Okay, great. Um, so, I just have a couple of slides to kind of summarize some key points and my perspective, and maybe ex share some experiences later during the discussion about um, data analytics in the clinical lab. So um, I don't need to tell this group that lab medicine data, first of all, is big data, and that's why we need um, data analytics. And, um, and I think there's several kind of different purposes that data analytics uh, can serve us in the, the lab medicine field. Um, so first, I think establishing data analytics platforms can help us avoid reinventing the wheel. So uh, if we're repeatedly analyzing this uh, same set or similar set of data in the same way every time. This is definitely a process that can be automated and many of us may have been in that boat where you get a set of data every month and you you're analyze it the same 
way. So I think data analytics can be fairly straightforward in this case. Um, also, of course, it can help us automate complex analysis for identifying a problem or classifying a problem or um, an answer to a specific question. And then I think uh, something that I would say is more new in our field is to be able to predict uh, problems and then being able to intervene appropriately. Um, and um, so actionable data, which is what Dustin has talked about, is very important and becoming increasingly important. Um, also, I think it's important to think about data analytics and time and space. So um, I think a lot of these points Dustin already alluded to, so we're largely kind of um, where we are now is we're looking at retrospective data a lot of the time. So um, not real time reports, uh, they're more static reports. And uh, we're getting to a point where we're starting to ask those questions and uh, trying to get more real time reports. Although like similarly to Dustin, we do have, for example, turnaround time reports and for example, critical call reports that are more real time. Uh, and then ultimately, I think maybe where we want to be is to be kind of more predictive in our with our data analytics. Uh, but um, uh, we're, I don't think we're there yet, maybe in the lab medicine field. Some of us are more further along than others. Um, and then uh, also thinking about kind of the space. So a lot of us are doing data analytics locally within our hospital, within our lab, or even across the health system. Um, but I think where data analytics can be very powerful, and then some groups have done this, um, is uh, to look at statewide or provincial data, to look at uh, patterns and provision of lab services and even optimizing resources um, in this manner. And then of course, looking at data nationally and internationally. Um, I, I'm not sure to what extent this has been done, but I think there's a lot of discussions going on. How do we access data that is more glo global? Um, and how do we compare ourselves even for to others and things like that and reduce redundancy? Um, so I think this is kind of where things are going in our field. Uh, and then as has Dustin has alluded to, we have kind of two primary purposes for data analytics. So one I think is a, um, that is done routinely by many of us is a look at uh, lab operations, uh, um, such as quality assurance monitoring, monitoring our quality indicators or key performance indicators, um, such as like critical call times, turnaround times, uh, the rate of pre-analytic errors. Um, also measuring the impact of quality improvement, sometimes like run charts and things like that. Um, examining lab test utilization patterns. Many of us are doing that at NCIKIDS. Uh, we definitely um, are involved a lot in that work. Um, other applications that I did hear about, but we don't necessarily use them here, um, is using data analytics, for example, for things like inventory management, repetitive kind of tasks, even like staffing workload management. There's really nice work coming out from other fields that potentially can be applied to lab medicine um, and also helping us maybe better recognize high priority tasks since we're constantly multitasking in the clinical lab. And then, of course, we have our clinical applications. So, um, for example, data analytics can help us more easily establish and validate clinical cutoffs or reference intervals. And we've seen a lot of that work um, being done by a lot of ACC members as well. Harmonization of lab test reporting, um, that has been a major focus also of data analytics uh, platforms, uh, monitoring lab test clinical performance, even like positive rates and things like that, uh, and supporting and interpretation of complex data, such as, for example, mass spectrometry data, looking at metabolomics and things like that. Um, digital imaging is something that's coming out, uh, for example, for Im immunofluorescence image interpretation or digital pathology. Um, also, molecular diagnos diagnostics is a growing area where data analytics tools, it's a very data analytics heavy field. And also, in integration of omics uh, maybe in the future is going to be a greater focus. Um, and then uh, I think uh, one area that is interesting is also how do we support evidence-based lab medicine? So um, how do we uh, measure kind of our lab service delivery in, in terms of how it relates to patient outcomes? Um, and then oftentimes we use data analytics simply for kind of data mining or discovery purposes um, also. 
Uh, so in terms of data analytics tools, there are numerous tools and all of us have kind of different proficiency in this area. So I think maybe 100% of us utilize like some sort of manual analysis, Excel, many of us GraphPad, like in grad school, I started using this tool and I still use it. Um, and more and more of us are starting to use R and R Studio, um, utilizing these autom automated reports, dashboards, or even third party tools. Um, uh, but I think for most of us, if I'm, if I may speak for most of us, it's difficult to learn a programming language um, from scratch and um, being able to do that on top of our regular work. And that's something that um, I'm for sure struggling with. Um, uh, and in terms of SICKIT specifically, then I'm just talking more generally what we utilize. So one major change that happened here is that we have implemented um, Epic Beaker um, at SickKids in 2018, and that's how I became involved in trying to get access to data. Um, so we, for example, have quality control dashboards uh, that we use for monthly QC signouts by, um, as well by uh, lab technologists as well as by biochemists. Um, we have, of course, Epic Workbench reports and Crystal, crystal reports that were set up to do um, a lot of different things, like uh, help us extract QC results and view QC results results, turnaround time data for individual tests. Um, now we're working on graphing them better using different tools, um, uh, being able to extract patient results very quickly at the time if we identify a problem and examine it. This has been a great tool, which in the past we didn't have access to, um, looking at test utilization patterns. Um, and Slicer Dicer is something that's used at in our hospital quite a bit. I personally haven't used it, but I know that it's a widely utilized tool to be able to um, kind of uh, filter data in the way that you want. Um, and we're currently moving kind of in the direction of trying to build more um, Power BI dashboards for, for various purposes. Um, and we have a whole team that's dedicated to that, um, uh, it, that is a part of the kind of the hospital data analytics infrastructure uh, and using these to um, mo monitor some of the quality indicators. Um, and then just my last point is in terms of how can we use data analytics in our work. I think one thing that I learned from this kind of whole experience of trying to um, uh, get access to data and make sure that we have um, the tools for analyzing it is it's important to work with many different st stakeholders and it takes many different people. And I think Dustin has already alluded to as well. So we have, of course, our medical scientific staff um, uh, who are um, who can ask kind of specific questions or lab operations leaders that can ask directed questions for specific purposes. Um, we have our LIS team that's very helpful since they understand data structure very well. And we have a separate data reports team. Uh, so all three of us have to work very closely together in order to get the right data. Um, and then we have some clinical champions if we're working on joint projects. And of course, so, so something that we don't currently have in our department is an informatics team. Uh, but I think this is a trend that I'm trying to, I'm starting to see more and more that you do need some uh, more dedicated resources if you want to start doing kind of more of the fancier things. Um, and then that's all I have. Um, and I'll pass it along to Jamie at this point. Thank you so much, Lucia. So our next panelist is Dr. Min Yu. Uh, Min is an Associate Director of Clinical Chemistry at the University of Kentucky Medical Center. She also has an appointment as an Assistant Professor of Pathology and Lab Medicine at the University of Kentucky College of Medicine. And today, Min's going to be sharing with us some examples of data analytic applications at her institutions that they've used to improve their operations and to gain insights into their specific patient population. So Min, feel free to share your slides. Sure. Thank you, Jamie, for the nice introduction. Uh, let me share my screen. Can you see my screen now? Okay. Yes, we can. So, uh, so I think uh, Lucia has explained this very well about why we need to do data ana analytics in the lab medicine. Uh, we have generated tremendous of data in the lab medicine, but those data just sitting there, we may not well utilize those data to give us better insights. So by doing that um, can provide us an easier way to identify some of the issues or concerns in the lab operation and also help us to make decisions to 
improve our quality of day-to-day -day operation and to make our work more effective and efficient. Um, so I think that that's what we try to achieve by doing the data analytics in the lab medicine. So the major data sources uh, that uh, we pull from uh, at UK is the EHR system, which we now transition to the EPIC, and also the lab information system. Um, we used to have SunQuest, now we move to the Beaker. And uh, some of the data you can just call directly from the instrument. And the major tools uh, we use here, including the basic Excel, I think everybody use that. Uh, and also um, I myself use R or uh, R Studio and the Python if I need to do machine learning. Uh, so then I'll just give you guys some of the real examples, uh, simple examples from our clinical lab at the University of Kentucky. Uh, most of those examples are looking at historical data. So in another way is descriptive analysis. It's not uh, using the data to, to predict what would happen. So this is not for the prediction analysis. Okay. Um, so first example is uh, we have this uh, mass back based assay. Uh, we decide to move this to the batch analysis by the automated the liquid uh, handler processor. So then we need to make a decision how many times do we need to do the batch analysis and the, what's the best time point to pick for the batch analysis. Uh, so what um, I asked for is to get the data from our lab information system about uh, the data elements, including the test name and the, the receiving time in the lab, container ID, and then the tool I just used just a simple Excel using the paper chart and table. And then um, what I got the figures here, we have the volume we, we received and then um, the time across every day. And we have the weekday here. And then from this graph, and I decide to do the two batches a day and then um, at each specific time. So that's just a very simple analysis. I think everybody can, can, can do this. This is just an example to show you what um, you can do easily uh, to make a decision if you need to do any change. Another example is turn-on time. And uh, we all monitor the turn-on time in our lab medicine practice. Uh, so the reason for this uh, particular example is that we got some complaints from the providers regarding this particular assay. Um, and then I want to look at, so what's the bottleneck? Uh, how we can improve our turn on time? Uh, so similarly, I got the data from lab information system. And then here I use the R software. Um, I have two different ways to look at this. One is this one is figure is similar to what I just showed you previous in the previous slides by the Excel, um, but this is just done by R. So we have the hour of the day, we have the, this is turn on time, um, and then we have the weekdays by different color. So from here you can say, okay, same like Tuesday and Wednesday is a problematic one and during this time period. And also the, on the right side is a heat map. So you can tell that this similarly, um, Tuesday and Wednesday during this known time would be the problematic one. So probably we need to add additional hands during those days and this time period. So that's just another example that um, to help us identify the problem and how we can improve that. So next example is the reference interval. So we need to reevaluate our reference interval for all the analyze at our uh, institution every five years. So uh, the biggest challenge for reference interval reevaluation is how to get enough um, healthy samples. Uh, the volunteer from the lab will, will have like limited age distribution. Um, so what I did here is I obtained the data from some of the outpatient clinics uh, that with more healthy visits, such as family medicine, primary care, student health, OBGYN. 
And then um, I use the R software and doing the non-parametric analysis. And you can see here, we have the eight different age group. So this is uh, younger than one year old and this is uh, older than one year old. And this is a box plot. And then from there, I got this uh, reference interval based on the R analysis. Um, it's just a very simple syntax. You can get it easily done. Um, so I prefer the R to do this kind of analysis. Um, so next example uh, I try to show you here is we monitor our patient median on a daily basis. So this is not real time, but it's like every 24 hour. Um, so the data is actually from still from lab information system. It just automatically drops to the certain folder and then it will be automated to calculate the patient median and a number and also the mean is also calculated. But on the plot, uh, we only plot the median here and then the new data will be accumulated as a new data point. And if you have a multiple over this, it will pop up all the information associated with each data point. Because uh, I think this will be a additional quality metric in addition to your QC to see um, if your assay is performing stable or not. The last example is uh, test utilization. So this is uh, done by the ALUP because ALUP is our reference lab. Um, so they have this uh, data analytics. If you click on that button and then there's test utilization and you can, from here you can see uh, this is a volume, like which assay is, uh, has been mostly ordered as sent out and the cost wise. They also list who is a champion physician orders lab test. And then you have your test name here, unless I just block this because this is the UK um, information. But, but I think this is a good way that we as uh, lab medicine, we can do this to look at our in-house assay um, in addition to the send out as well. Um, so that's all the examples I just want to show you and how you can utilize the data and then do your data analytics on your own easily. Um, so from now, I just pass it to Jenny. Yep, thank you, man. Yeah. All right, everyone. So our fourth panelist is Dr. Thomas Durant. He's the Director of Chemical Pathology and Laboratory Information Technology at Yale New Haven Hospital. He's also an assistant professor of laboratory medicine at Yale School of Medicine. And today he's gonna to be describing to us what data analytics means at their institution, as well as providing his perspective as the director of laboratory information technology there. So Tommy, I'll hand it off to you. Hi, thanks for inviting me. Um, nice sweater, Chris Cook. Um, really like that sweater, yeah. <laughs> um, I knew that everyone, all the other panelists were gonna give kind of a more, um, like a, a, a pretty robust overview of like different examples of data analytics at their institution. So I didn't want to go into that. I just thought, I'd, you know, because it most it'd be somewhat duplicative. And I think I'll just keep my, my my time short so we can jump into some of the questions. But you know, I think one of the primordial questions we had asked when we were talking about this the the, the concept of this um this panel was just what does data analytics mean mean to each of us? And I think I think that's an interesting question. I think that you know. You know, um, over the last few days, thinking about what what that is for me is that um, it's really ultimately just the evolution of what it is that we normally do as lab directors, managers, and um, in that now that there is more digital information available, you know, how can we use that as leverage to inform our decisions to improve our you know the quality of ourselves, our relationships our processes um, that we offer, our products and our service to the patients we, um, we take care of. And, um, you know, I think that, at, you know, as we sort of wrap everything that we do that, at, you know, all the previous panelists have described um, into the term of data analytics, it, you know, it really ultimately comes down to, you know, how is it that we can do that? Well, I mean, I think it largely depends on sort of two things. And, and I think the degree to which we see these things available to people um, in the lab at different institutions ultimately hinges on like two main facets, which is 
access to the data. <clears throat> and I think that that's starting to improve, but sometimes it's quite dependent on what you have at your institution and what the vendors can provide. Um, and then access not only to the data, but also to the tools that you would build on top of the data for the end users. So, I mean, when we talk, when, you know, when Dustin was talking about the, you know, the idea of having, um, you know, dedicated resources to, to data analytics people, um, you know, that, 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 that's an interesting, that's an interesting thing to talk about because it's like, ideally in an ideal world, we would have something where, you know, everyone could access the data, everyone in the lab could be fluent in this sort of um, data analytics space and um, be able to just, you know, make decisions within, you know, each of the sections of the lab or the whole lab if it's not divided into sections. Um, and, um, you know, we, we have a similar structure here too, where we have sort of like these data analytics people who, you know, each of the directors and managers reach out to when they need insight into what's going on in their lab from a data perspective. Um, you know, but ideally it'd be, it, you know, it'd be great if, you know, we, we could figure out a way to just make it, make the barrier to entry lower so that everyone could get in there and get their hands dirty and, you know, ask questions of the data. Um, and then, so access is one thing, not only to the data, but to the tools that we build on top of them. And then I think access to the, um, you know, the other thing is a skill set in terms of, um, you know, how, if we're going to do data analytics, you know, how do we get people to have two fundamental skills, which are, you know, how to form a question that can be asked of data. I think that's sort of the, the starting point. And then second is, you know, how, how do we give them the tools to, to answer that question? Um, so it's kind of, in my mind, it's these two things that, you know, we're working on in our institution to try and um, provide people with it's, it's access and it's skill set. And then, and then, and then lastly, it's, it's support. You know, if, if you do sort of abstract that function of your lab into a dedicated group, you know, how do you, how do you put numbers and estimate, you know, what the throughput and bandwidth of that group is, you know, with like software, you tend to think of, you know, general rules with such as, you know, you need a full FTE for a year to build something and then 30% of an FTE to then maintain it. You know, how, how do we, how do we start to, you know, come together you know, with consensus on what those things are through experience so that we can properly budget time and resources to maintain all these things that we use to derive insight and, you know, be able to bring data to the table so that we can, you know, make informed uh, decisions, um, you know, in these meetings that, you know, oftentimes the question comes down to, well, what is, what is reality? What is truth? And it's like, well, we need data analytics to solve that and figuring out how to give that to people, I think is, the, is a very interesting question. All right. Thanks, Tommy. And thank you for the other panelists for also sharing with you what data analytics means to you and at your institutions. So now I'm going to hand things off to Anna Merrill, who's going to moderate the panel discussion. Great. Thank you, Jamie. Um, so I have a few questions I would like to ask the panelists, but feel free. Um, if anybody has a question, please enter it in the chat and we'll try to incorporate it into our discussion. So the first question is, how, I would like to know how the panelists either got interested in or started working in the field of data analytics. So Dustin, I think we'll start with you. Cool. So for me, I started a degree in bioinformatics because I was interested in kind of how data can inform biology at that time. Um, and then I also started uh, to pursue a degree in computer information science. Um, before deciding that that was going to take too long and I was going to get a PhD in bioanalytical chemistry, so uh, which took less time. <laughs> um, so I've been interested in this, uh, the, the, the computer side for quite a while, and I knew that going into my fellowship. And so when, during my fellowship, I actively pursued that, and my fellow director was on board with letting me do that. So I got to spend quite a bit of time with our analytics team um, at the time, it was at Yale, so I was working with Tommy and uh, his group. So uh, that is where I come from, and kind of where that I, uh, the drive comes from. Thanks, Dustin. Min, do you have any insights to add about how you got interested in or started in data data analytics? Yeah, sure. So my background is quite different from what just Dustin said because um, he had those computer programming um, experience before and uh, has been involved in this field. And uh, um, my background is I was uh, 
like in medical school and uh, I never been to any um, like computer programming classes at all. But the, the major reason that I got pulled into the data analytics mainly because uh, during my training time at UVA as a clinical chemistry fellowship, um, those projects that hand to me, um, like look at those mass spectrometry data and to look at which are the good data, which are the bad data, and the, like generate a rule um, to define those or monitor patient the medians. Uh, so those projects, when those are handled to me, uh, I just feel like I do not want to do this manually um, because I, I used to joke a lot, like oh, I'm lazy. Uh, I hate to do those like time consuming things and I want to do things smart. So I start to explore those different software um, like R. Um, I know I have no experience at all with, with programming, but, but trust me, it, if I can do that, everyone can do that. It, it's just a, <laughs> not that hard as what you saw. Once you have a project to start with and just experiment with that, and then you will enjoy how like fast this can um, give you a really good visualization of your data and give you some of the clues that you can never thought about previously. So I actually wrote an article um, like two years ago in the JLM um, about embracing informatics, talking about my own strength, how I get um, into learn the uh, Python and R programming. If you guys interested, you can look at that, yeah. Great, thank you. It sounds like both of you, um, your, your training experience has really helped to kind of hone in your data analytics skills. So I guess my, my next question um, is, do the panelists think that, you know, formal training in data analytics or informatics should be included in either pathology residency training programs or clinical chemistry fellowship training programs as like a core skill set that we have identified as being necessary for future success? Or do you think that on the job training um, or kind of figuring it out as you go um, is sufficient. So Lucia, do you want to comment on that? Yeah, sure. I, I think it, I think it is important to give people kind of our trainees the basic tools. Um, I, um, I don't believe that uh, most of them, you know, have in their daily life or daily work have the capacity to be kind of, um, regularly be involved in very high level data analytics, uh, but I think it's important to have the basics. And I think even thinking about it earlier, for example, when I was uh, in my graduate school program, they actually made it mandatory for everyone to take an R course. And that's uh, maybe one of the best things that happened uh, in terms of uh, going into fellowship and, and now having some basic R skills to do some basic things. Um, uh, and uh, actually, in, in terms of your question, have you um, uh, trainees getting access to training? That actually has been a topic of discussion a lot because uh, we do have a clinical chemistry fellowship that's affiliated with the University of Toronto. Um, and our program directors, as well as the department itself, uh, really prioritize this in terms of uh, giving fellows this type of training. Uh, but it's been challenging identifying what is the right course exactly to take that will give them all those tools that they need because of course like statistics is important then R is important and then um, if identifying a single resource that will give all those um, uh, the right resources uh, I think it has been a challenge from discussions with our program directors and our fellows. Thanks for that. Yeah, I think the, it sounds like the earlier, the better that um, folks can get exposed to the possibilities of data analytics and the potential, you know, the, the possibilities for resources and tools, the better. I'm going to hand it over to, to Sarah for a question from the chat. We have a question from Grace Kuhner. Uh, have others faced challenges with accessing data in a timely manner due to PHI concerns? Uh, and any success with requesting at least access to some de-identified data on an immediate basis for urgent troubleshooting? Uh, and Thank you for that. Uh, I think I'll try to punt this one first to Tommy um, and anybody else that uh, has some some answers for that. I think the the main issues we've had with that was um, finding a place to do the analysis um, that's compliant with the you know IT HIPAA security policies of our institution. Um, you know, so like 
I mean, even going back to the previous question for a second, um, you know, getting residents and fellows to do data analytics projects for me some, often ends up hinging on whether or not they have a dedicated workstation for the data to live on um, that's encrypted and isn't their personal laptop. Um, and so, and then two, you know, if if we're if we're doing you know retrospective data exports from the LIS for anything that's going to be publishable or create generalizable knowledge in the context of what constitutes research, you know, we have to go ahead and do an IRB and then um, you know, some even though it's somewhat of a short and it can be exempt, it, um, it, it's, it still is a barrier to getting it. Um, and then we got to tell them where we're going to store it, and then we got to tell them which identifiers we're going to have. And you know, while they view the medical record number as a big thing, they don't tend to view the specimen ID as a big thing, even though they're roughly equivocal if you have access to the same system. So I don't know. It's a, it's it, it's a it's a weird and sort of undefined scenario, and it's um it's definitely I think a barrier, but um I, you know I. I, I don't really know what to do about it. <laughs> it sounds like uh, it's a it's a barrier, but you have been able to get around it by by like yeah, identifying it, the key players. That kind yeah, of we can get around it. It just it just makes it a little difficult to like you know to to make it scalable to all of the residents and fellows in the training program because you have to kind of check all those boxes, and that can take time and resources. It's, it just makes more overhead, but you know it's it's because we we live in a regulated industry. Um, do you, I saw Dustin go uh, off mute, um, and then yeah. it looks like Lucia also has something to add, so we'll go in that order. Okay. I, I was just going to say, um, PHI, at least for operations, is generally not an issue. Um, but if we do have to pull data from the EPIC side of things, it becomes a, uh, a, a bigger issue and more hurdles to jump through. But we can generally do it. The problem is it's not very fast. And if you're looking for something fast, that's not the way to go about it. If it's something that lives within my system, then generally we can get to it pretty quickly. And I can get to that usually within a day. So... Yeah, I think I just wanted to add it. So when we switched to Epic Beaker and three years ago, we had a huge challenge accessing data. There was basically no pathway because the hospital was also undergoing a whole data governance kind of initiative uh, and um, they were kind of restructuring. So now there's actually a central data request database basically where all the labs requests are prioritized together with the rest of the hospital. Uh, and that of course can be very challenging. So um, in parallel with trying to get access to the data, I think it was important to explain our role. So kind of I, I wrote descriptions of what I do and why I need access to the data and kind of wrote a formal letter and um, kind of our medical scientific staff got together and brought this up to the leadership team. And I think once they understood the role and uh, our role and also were able to kind of restrict it to the right people. And then there was a, a very, um, it, it was a much more comfortable conversation to have. Uh, but I think it's not a given that if you work in the lab, you necessarily have access to data. And that's been extremely uh, frustrating. Um, and especially what's been a challenge is large data. So you can for maybe get a data from one day, but if we want to look at six months, you know, that just wasn't feasible many of the time. So um, uh, one, one of those things is really explaining your role and um, uh, outlining exactly what you do uh, and why that's important. And uh, actually, we highlighted the importance of regulatory compliance, for example, uh, when there is a discordant proficiency test and things like that, that we do require the data, we can't wait for six months, um, you know, to have that. So I think that's one pathway to try and get access if you're struggling. So yeah, um, <clears throat> prior to, uh, so we got to move to APEC this June. So prior to APEC, I think we encountered similar challenge to acquire data, especially we want to acquire those clinical outcomes data related um, so we can easily get those lab related data from the SunQuest, from our SunQuest people. That's not a big challenge, although you need to wait for some time because they always say we, they have to prioritize things. They have a big list of things. But um, the clinical part is the most challenging part because those are holding in a different set of people, um, like data warehouse people, and then they they really like refuse to give us the access to those data. Um, but after Epic, I think we can actually pull different reports 
including the clinical um, information as well. So if we want to do some correlation of the lab data with clinical outcome, I think that's a big improve. Yeah, so it's awesome to have Epic. So thank you, panelists. And so that segues into the next question that we received in the chat from Leon Friesen. Uh, question states, regarding clinical lab 2.0 and the shift to outcome-driven reimbursement and lab ordering recommendations, what is the scope of lab professionals in providing, interpreting, and utilizing laboratory data for these efforts? How can lab professionals secure a seat at the table for these efforts in these early stages? Instead of calling anybody out, <laughs> if anyone feels the uh, need to step in first. So to, what is the scope of lab professionals in providing, interpreting, and utilizing laboratory data for these efforts? So Min, I, I recall in your uh, last answer, you mentioned the clinical part was the more challenging part. So taking the data, interpreting it, getting actionable information out of it? Yeah, um, just to give you an example. Uh, so we we try to actually, I want to develop a machine learning method to uh, do the protein electrophoresis sign out. Uh, so I want to get the clinical part, like uh, what the diagnosis and what the medication the patient has. Uh, I mean, cause you cannot just use lab data to develop any machine learning algorithm, right? Um, then it's just challenging because we, we have uh, lab informatics teams uh, in our department and we uh, arrange several meetings to talk with those people that who hold those, those data tightly, not to give us access. And then we have several meetings arranged and just there's so many barriers, so many political things, they just do not uh, do not understand that we really need those data. It's just the wasting time and not getting anything progress. Um, so that's just an example. I mean, this is the clinical outcome part that um, it's hard to get, not the lab data. That's the big challenge, yeah. I, I would also say uh, I had the advantage of sitting on the um, e EHR advisory board. So we have the ear of the uh, CMIO. Um, so we are able to plead our case in front of a, a smaller audience, I guess, um, and, and directly connect with the people that are making decisions on a lot of the information, informatics side of things. So uh, we do get that kind of advantage. And I always know kind of what projects they're working on, and I'm at those meetings so we can discuss things. And if there's something that doesn't seem right, I definitely speak up. <laughs> mm -hmm. Tommy, do you have any thoughts on how lab professionals can secure a seat at the table? For these efforts? Yeah, I mean, I think it, I don't know, it's tough because like the, the way that that analytics stuff evolves at each institution is just so unique to each institution that it's hard to, I don't know, I, I, I think it's just knowing, you know, if you're not going to be the one sort of driving it, and that's what's unique about our institution is that the person who drove the aggregation of pretty much all of the data within our health system from all the different specialties into one sort of computational health platform was within laboratory medicine. Mm -hmm. So I have like this very weird perspective on how that works. You know, it's like the lab medicine person basically is driving that massive shift. But I think that if that person was in another department, I think the thing to do would be to get involved is to just have sort of institutional awareness to know who that is and sort of get, you know, get collaborative with them and sort of get, get at the table, get at the meetings and, and help and help, you know, advise them on sort of like what data within lab is available to get it into their platform and, and into a workable format. Um, you know, I think at the, it's sort of like the IDN or the integrated delivery network level, it's important also for us to, to help them sort of, you know, recognize the complexities of lab data, maybe help them get it into a common data model and have it, you know, coded appropriately so that it's most, you know, most easily extracted for end user purposes on the back end. <clears throat> Thank you. Yeah, that was, I'll, I'll hand it back to you. Sounds good. Yeah, thanks so much for all those great responses. I think it can be hard to kind of get your, get your, you know, name in your face into some of those collaborative projects, but we really are the ones that know labor, the potential of laboratory data, what can and what cannot be done with it. And there are lots of folks who are wanting to use our laboratory data. 
So I think even being able to demonstrate small successes will, um, will, will kind of be, um, enable you to participate more in bigger projects. Um, what might be the last question is, um, so I'm curious, many of you mentioned different tools and resources that have helped you in your different data analytics projects. So I'm curious um, what tool and or resource, if you had to pick one or maybe two, has been most helpful to you um, so far in your work in data analytics. So I think I'll start with, um, I'll start with Min. Yeah, I think I mentioned earlier that uh, I like using R. Um, then next thing is the Python. So uh, if you want to learn those things, the resources, I, I think um, in the AACC University and also uh, MSACL, they have those courses that you can, you can join and to learn those. And if you want to learn this yourself, there is a, a website called Stack Overflow uh, that there's a lot of discussion about how you can solve problems um, efficiently. There's a lot of discussion. Um, and I think uh, those are the major tools I use. And of course, I do use Excel um, as well as showing you paper chart, paper table. Those are very simple things um, if you just want to do a quick look at the data. Um, um, I heard people using Tableau. Tableau, I think, is another thing people use a lot. It's kind of Excel, but it's like high level of Excel, probably. I, I do not use that myself, but but I know a lot of people using Tableau to to do those dashboards, look, looking at those turn time and other quality metrics as well. But there is a lot of uh, free tools that you can explore. Great. Dustin, do you want to comment with some of your favorite tools or resources? I'd have to say um, it's R and Python too. So those are my number one and number two go-to for a lot of the work I do. Um, I actually started Python first and transitioned over to R because there's a lot more support for R um, in, in the community. So um, and the one, you know, the one thing I think is a good read for anyone is R for data analytics. Um, I think that's a good starting place if uh, you want to get involved. It starts out really slow and gets much more difficult as you go along. So, and it has lots of good examples. So, I have a copy of that on my bookshelf. I should have had it ready to go. <laughs> um, Lucia, do you want to chime in with your thoughts on this? I think I agree with uh, all the other speakers. And uh, one thing that I'll add, it's been tremendously helpful is the people that I work with. Um, uh, so our LIS team and our reporting team, once we got kind of got to know each other and what each person can do and what kind of role we can play, um, it's become a lot easier and a lot more efficient having access to the right data. So I think uh, in addition to like the hands-on tools, um, the team uh, has been really great. Building a team is, I think, is very important. Thanks. Tommy, I'll let you um, add anything before handing it back to Sarah. Yeah, I think that, yeah, um, Lucia said what I was going to say, which was, I think that the, 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 or, you know, I was going to say the, the people who can help us get access to the data and crunch it for us and sort of democratize the use of data within our institution has been probably the some of the best resources so that so that um but i mean in, in terms in terms of tools yeah we're, we're the same you know we're basically we're excel um our python and um as far as dashboards we use tableau um i think on in some parts of the in some parts of our health ecosystem we use power bi but it's um you know same same just you know dashboards basically <clears throat> great and the panelists have graciously put together um, a, a list of some recommended resources that we will make available after, after this session. So be on the lookout for that. Sarah, I will hand it back to you. Awesome. Thanks, Anna. Um, so an enormous thank you to our panelists uh, who took some time before the holidays to actually pull this together um, and for their great discussion, uh, as well as to Anna and Jamie for, for moderating this for us. Uh, 
it has been very exciting um, and has gotten me excited for some things that I have happening in the new year as well. So thank you all. Um, also, thank you to our attendees for coming so that we could, could have this session. And uh, very importantly, thank you to Melanie Gibson and Jordan Bradford um, for coordinating this from ACC who organized this, kept us on track um, and made sure that we could do this. We definitely couldn't do this without you. A uh, couple of housekeeping notes. Um, so as Anna mentioned, um, there, the panelists um, and moderators have kindly put together um, their kind of top resources, top references and tools that they use. So we'll be posting that on the cycle website. Uh, and this entire session will be available as well on the cycle website within the next week or two. And we'll post on the artery and link you there uh, when it is uh, up and available. So you can check either of those resources. Um, with that, uh, we'd like to wish you all a happy and safe holidays. And thank you again for attending. Take care.